Thank you so much for that warm introduction and many thanks to my elder brother, Dr. Banshi, for having me here. Always a pleasure to be here. So the topic assigned to me is talk on old is gold, pyoglitazone, putting it in perspective because we all talk of the newer molecules and all the newer benefits we get from newer molecules. But you need to remember that does not mean that the older molecules are no longer needed and are completely out. So I'm going to set the context and I think this is where the whole story starts. The omino octet, multiple pathophysiologies and multiple drugs that address multiple pathophysiologies. But to make things simple, where did the whole story start? Two primary defects without which diabetes will not occur. Obviously, the impairment in insulin secretion is important. But what sets the ball rolling is actually a buildup of insulin resistance. So the liver, the muscle and the adipose tissue. So we know as long as the beta cell is functional, there is hyperinsulinemia that is going to compensate and keep the glucose levels normal. Eventually, as the beta cell function is declining, there is impaired glucose tolerance, prediabetes, and then eventually comes type 2 diabetes. And that is how diabetes progresses and all of us know that. Putting things in perspective when it comes to us Indians, I think very important aspect of the Asian Indian phenotype is the thin fat Indians that all of us are with more of insulin resistance. And we all know what does insulin resistance do? That is the fertile soil for the NCD pandemic. Endothelial dysfunction, increased platelet reactivity, vascular inflammation. So all the different cardiometabolic disorders that we talk of, the, so the soil is insulin resistance. This was a study that actually looked at whether insulin resistance or whether was it the beta cell dysfunction, which was actually more correlated to the multiple cardiometabolic disorders, looking at more than 90,000 patients. And this clearly showed that it was insulin resistance, which was more common, more prevalent when it comes to cardiometabolic disorders compared to beta cell dysfunction also. So now when we ask, do we still need pyoglitazone when we have all these newer molecules? Well, the question that we need to ask ourselves is, is there any other molecule, any other drug that treats this primary abnormality, which is insulin resistance. So when it comes to the sensitizers, we have metformin, but yes, when it comes to sensitizers, I think the glitter zones stand out because of their unique targets and the unique actions that they do, which suit us, the insulin resistant population. So there is always a space for sensitizers in our prescriptions and they have to be there come what may. Now, I think going back to the pathophysiology, what is pyoglitazone doing? What is it targeting in the pathophysiology? Muscle insulin resistance, hepatic insulin resistance, and most important, adipocyte insulin resistance, which is not targeted even by metformin. Beyond that, of course, there is no hypoglycemia, which is very important when it comes to choosing the right drug. And of course, they offer some amount of beta cell protection also. So where do you place pyoglitazone? I think all across the spectrum of type 2 diabetes, right from pre-diabetes when the insulin resistance starts, to newly diagnosed diabetes and then eventually chronic diabetes also because we all know that insulin resistance still remains stable. How do they act? I'll not go into that. We all know these are ligands of the PPAR gamma receptors bind to the retinoid X receptors resulting in transcription of different insulin responsive genes that are involved in glucose production, transport and utilization translating into all these different multiple actions. And the beta cell preservation very beautifully demonstrated with both molecules actually. Rosiglitazone in dream study and pyoglitazone in act now clearly showing that most of these benefits were derived from preservation of beta cell insulin secretory function which was facilitated by the glitazones. Do they work? I think nobody needs to know that. We all know almost 1 to 1.7% 1 HbA1c reduction. So as comparable to metformin and sulfonylureas and rather superior to gliptins and GLP-1s in duration 4. So very clearly potent drugs when it comes to HbA1c reduction. More so, we all talk of what else? Well, the antioxidant action. Reduction in MDA and superoxide dismutase clearly showing that not only is it giving glycemic control, but reducing oxidative stress. That is again something very, very important. What about the cardiac risk with pyoglitazone? I think there was a lot of controversy. I'll come to that in a little while. But let's first demystify the CV side effects of pyoglitazone. Time to rethink of this agent. 
what are the studies that have shown that proactive this was patients with pre existing cvd 5000 plus patients 50% previous mi 20% with previous stroke and 25% with pad what did the study come out with all these patients showing a significant reduction in the risk of subsequent mi by 28% and acute coronary syndrome by 38% Patients with previous stroke, pioglitazone actually reduced the risk of second stroke by 48%. Periscope, another study looking at the change in percent atheroma volume in 360 patients with type 2 diabetes and CAD, clearly showed a significant lower rate of progression of coronary atherosclerosis. Iris study, another landmark study used in patients who had had either a TIA or an ischemic stroke again showing a good significant reduction in the rate of coronary atherosclerosis progression compared with glimipride. Chicago study, again another study clearly showing the slowing in the progression of carotid intimal medial thickness. Improvement in left ventricular diastolic dysfunction, again seen in this study clearly showing pioglitazone improves whole body and myocardial insulin sensitivity, improves the LV diastolic function and the systolic function in patients with type 2 diabetes. So if you look at this figure, this clearly shows you there are too many cardiovascular benefits associated with this drug which are not associated with even other disreputable molecules. Beyond that, what is it doing? Obesity, redistribution of fat, we all know the subcute fat goes up, the visceral fat comes down, the healthy adipocyte generation occurs, hypertension, slight reduction in blood pressure, improvement in the lipid profile, reduction in triglycerides and increase in HDL. Furthermore, it converts the LDL particles from the atherogenic small dense particles to the larger more buoyant LDL which are the friendlier particles. Improvement in endothelial dysfunction. Good reduction in HbA1c, reduction in inflammatory markers. We, we had a great oration by Dr. Seshadri which actually talked of the oxidative stress. So this is one drug which is addressing that as well. And of course, reduction in hyperinsulinemia and improvement in insulin resistance. This is the antioxidant molecules, uh, the reduction in the pro-inflammatory mediators clearly seen with pioglitazone. So all these different studies showing all the different benefits. Beyond glucose lowering, I talked about the improvement in the profiles, the improvement in the dyslipidemia, the improvement in the insulin resistance. Pioneer showed that this was independent of the glycemic efficacy. And we all know about the benefits in NAFLD patients, a clear improvement in the liver parameters. Yes, there has been dispute. You need to use the drug with caution. Certain patients where it should not be used, we need to be very careful on that. And this is what I'm going to talk in this part of my session. Now, edema and weight gain, commonly seen with pioglitazone, 5% of patients treated with pioglitazone monotherapy or in combination therapy, especially with insulin, you'll see these kind of problems. 10% of patients treated with glitazones in combination with insulin will show you weight gain and edema. Remember, this is dose dependent. More marked if you are combining it either with insulin or sulfonylurea. Maybe 1 to 1.5 kilograms if you use low dose pioglitazone, but can go as high as 5 to 6 kilograms when you combine it with insulin. So this is where you need to use it with caution. Preferably not to use pioglitazone when your patient is on high doses of insulin. The weight gain may be attributable to a number of factors, increase in subcutaneous fat mass with either or no change or maybe a small reduction in the visceral fat mass. Water retention, fluid retention is a very common problem with pioglitazone, so you need to be very careful here. And of course, the positive calorie balance that comes in when the glycemic control is improved. Again, the remodeling of the adipose tissue, a very, very good effect that we see with pioglitazone, not seen with most of the other molecules. Increase in the subcutaneous adipose tissue mass approximately by 3.5%. Little or no effect on the visceral adipose tissue mass. So even if the patient is gaining weight, the fat redistribution is actually a beneficial aspect, a beneficial effect of glitazones, and of course, accompanied with a reduction in the hepatic triglyceride concentration, so reduction in the hepatic steatosis. And that is why this is one of the drugs that we use in patients with NAFLD. This is the 10-year observational follow-up of the proactive study, again clearly showing that the benefits are continued and you do not have any major signals of caution or alarm here. 
Bone fractures, yes. Again, something you need to watch out for, especially in the post-menopausal women who already have osteoporosis or osteopenia. So yes, you need to be very, very uh, cautious. You have to use it with caution in this particular age group, the elderly age group, where with men, you, there is no real signal. But yes, with postmenopausal women, you do see a slight increase in the risk of bone fractures because of the osteoclastic activity that happens. Macular edema, especially like I said, patients who are on high doses of insulin, pyoglitazone does increase macular edema. And therefore, if your patient on a retinopathy screening has been diagnosed with macular edema, you need to discontinue glitazones. And this is a very important part why retinopathy screening is also required for our patients and why some drugs you need to use with caution in patients who have retinopathy. Again, 1% of patients on pyoglitazone may come out with anemia. NHB reduction almost to the tune of 2 to 3 percent initially within the 4 to 12 weeks of initiation of therapy and then eventually it stabilizes probably because of the fluid retention that occurs with pyoglitazone. But anemia per se with pyoglitazone has never been a very serious problem enough to cause drug withdrawal but you need to obviously monitor your patient's hemoglobin as well when on this drug. Bladder cancer controversy actually was very, very important. We saw a lot of controversy happening when it comes to bladder cancer. Numerous observational studies that actually showed some kind of an association of pyoglitazone with bladder cancer came out. But we need to remember that diabetes per se is associated with a 50% increased risk in bladder cancer. So patients with diabetes are already predisposed to a higher risk of bladder cancer. And there have been lot of studies which could not really give a causal association to pyoglitazone and bladder cancer. If you look at the Asian data, clearly all these studies, you know, the case report from South India with eight bladder cancer patients actually set the bowling, uh, ball rolling in 2013, leading to actually the banning of pyoclitazone, but then eventually data came out to show that there was not really a causal association. And a chronic high dose pyoclitazone use, you know, there's literature which says a lifetime use of about 28,000 milligrams of pyoclitazone is actually required to probably have a signal of pyoclitazone. So that is why now the DCGI recommends a low dose pyoglitazone and I think ours is the only country where we actually came out with this 7.5 milligram dose. Because you know if you put your patient on 7.5 milligrams then even if you're using it for a lifetime it doesn't count up to 28,000 milligrams. So that's the justification of the 7.5. So the US FDA actually looked at all the data and clearly said that, you know, uh, this is a very important part. 20,903 patients with type 2 diabetes to be treated with pyoglitazone high dose, one patient with bladder cancer. That was the kind of association if you talk in numbers comes out. So yes, pyoglitazone does come out as a winner when it comes to old is gold because of the unique mechanism of action that it has. You need to be important. US FDA clearly says do not use pyoglitazone in patients who have either an active bladder cancer or use it in caution in patients who have a prior history of bladder cancer. So I think when you have the other molecules, you may not use this drug. You know, so that's the kind of uh, opinion. And of course, you need to counsel your patients to report any signs or symptoms of blood in the urine, hematuria, urinary urgency, pain on urination, back or abdominal pain, probably signaling bladder cancer, which does not, which I think all of us will agree we've hardly seen in our clinical practice. So pyoglitazone does remain a valid treatment option, but yes, you need to choose the right patient for the drug if you want the benefits. And the Indian story, I think June 2013, pyoglitazone was banned. And then in August 2013, eventually the ban was revoked. The DCGI clearly tells you pyoglitazone may not be used as the first line of therapy because now we have a lot of agents that justify their use as first line and second line agents. Very important to understand that patients with active bladder cancer or with a history of bladder cancer, those with uninvestigated hematuria should not receive pyoglitazone and you need to monitor your patients well if they are on this drug. So, Coming back to the basic question, do we still need pyoglitazone for treatment of type 2 diabetes? Yes, of course. We do need it in the right patient because I think this is the most potent and the best insulin sensitizer that we have available. So there is, of course, the risk involved. You need to be careful where not to use it. But there are still 
numerous benefits of the drug which actually tell us where it can be used most important as a sensitizer as an efficacious and a durable potent drug when it comes to hba1c reduction because it does so at the low risk of hypoglycemia i told you the basic reason why it is there still in the algorithms is because of its improvement in insulin resistance and of course also an improvement in the beta cell function prevents the progression of igt to type 2 diabetes act now study clearly showed that i think compared to lifestyle and the other drugs it actually showed a better 72% reduction in progression to diabetes in patients who had pre diabetes because the moment you address the insulin resistance the glycemic levels start come down along with lifestyle and diet improvement in the cardiovascular risk factors the hdl levels going up the triglycerides coming down the blood pressure and the inflammatory markers also coming down reduction in microalbuminuria with the drug seen in number of studies reduction in the cardiovascular events in the high risk diabetes patients and i showed you the proactive i showed you iris i showed you the meta analysis and the chicago study reduction in the cardiovascular events in patients with type 2 diabetes with ckd improvement in the endothelial dysfunction and of course the improvement in nash and nafilt so i think uh, uh, amongst the newer drugs we just have the sglt2 inhibitors where again we are seeing an indication probably uh, future indication in nafilt patients because of the improvement in hepatic fat but this is the drug that actually targets both the adipocyte and the hepatic fat so to conclude type 2 diabetes epidemic in india of course may be due to strong genetic factors coupled with urbanization and lifestyle changes which have led to a high insulin resistance in our population and asian indian phenotype the most characteristic feature we have is insulin resistance the contributing factor for this increased insulin resistance may be this asian indian phenotype that all of us have which is basically increase in the central obesity and increase in the visceral fat pioglitazone addresses the core defect in type 2 diabetes pathogenesis which is insulin resistance it has proven to be a cost effective cardio protective drug for diabetes pre diabetes and insulin resistant patients physicians need to use pioglitazone judiciously in selected cases where it is indicated preferably not as a first line agent that is very clear so if you have a patient where you probably need to target that insulin resistance that is where even a small dose of pioglitazone can do the trick patients with heart failure patients with osteoporosis blurring vision where you suspecting diabetic macular edema they should not be given pioglitazone should be stopped in those patients lower dose of pioglitazone in combination therapy could be equally effective and may be used to avoid the cumulative long term risk associated with pioglitazone and pharmacovigilance with this drug is the key if you want to use it in your patients thank you so much